The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on the Federal Grants Update for 2021. I'm so glad that all of you could join us today to hear this important presentation about recent updates to form guidance. Uh, my name is Amy Miller. I'm the Federal Grants Administrator for the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, or OPR. And here to present today is Karen Norris from Kinoko Consulting. We are recording today's webinar, and the video and the slide presentation will both be available on the OPR website for you to review or share with your colleagues. Throughout the presentation, please enter any questions that you might have in the questions tab, and we will set aside time at the end for Q&A. Uh, we will not be using the chat box today, so please use the questions tab. Okay, and again, uh, we will be recording today's webinar, so please be aware of that. Um, the recording is also going to be on the OPR YouTube page. And so before we get started with Karen's presentation, I'd like to let you know about some of the federal grant resources that we have available on the OPR website. You can find this all at opr.ca.gov. And you can find all of these resources by clicking the link for federal assistance, which you'll find under the CEQA and State Clearinghouse tab on the OPR homepage. The State Clearinghouse at OPR is California's single point of contact for the intergovernmental review of federal programs. The Applying for Federal Grants link is where you'll go when you're applying for a federal grant and need to submit notice of your application to comply with the Executive Order on Intergovernmental Review. Here is where applicants will submit their notice along with the SF-424 Federal Grant cover sheet. All notices can be viewed on this page under the Submissions tab. If you'd like to receive notifications of federal grant applications submitted in your area, you can do so here under the Registrations tab. Uh, now back on this page, the Federal Grant Resources link highlighted here is where you can go to see a library of information to help you learn more about applying for and managing grants. And this also includes links to the grants pages of every federal agency. Here is also where we will be posting the slides and recording from today's presentation under the events and trainings tab. And then last here, you can see our federal grants e-list, uh, which hopefully most of you already receive, but if not, you can sign up for it here. This weekly email provides updates on federal grant opportunities, news, trainings, and events. And now with that, I'll turn things over to our presenter, Karen Norris. Karen is a nationally recognized expert in the grants community based in the Washington DC area. She regularly presents at state and national conferences and has provided expert testimony about federal grants to the Maryland General Assembly and the United States Senate Subcommittee on Federal Financial Management. And we're very pleased to have her here with us today. So thank you, Karen. Thanks, Amy. Thanks for, uh, that was a great introduction. It was nice to see um, the website and the information that you have available uh, about grants. So uh, with that, let me advance the slide. There we go. So we will have three objectives today for this webinar. We're going to take a look at some past federal regulations, legislation, and other federal actions that have impacted the uniform guidance, which is provides uh, the guidance for federal agencies and non-federal entities um, as they're administering their grants, pursuing and managing their grants. Um, we're gonna look at some past funding issues that have placed grants at risk. Why is there so much attention now on risk and performance and results? 
And then, of course, the the main event is to go through um, two updates, recent updates to the uniform guidance. One was a great big revision that was published August 13th, 2020, and became effective uh, November 12th, 2020. And then a few months ago, there was an, a smaller update in February with some corrections. So a few words. The uniform guidance is a living document which means it's going to be updated. It, it, it's affected by other actions that are happening uh, in Congress, it, it, with OMB, with GAO, as different legislation is passed. So the uniform guidance is, is going to be updated. And it has been updated in the past, and we expect it to be updated in the future. So revisions will occur over time as new legislation and other requirements are implemented. OMB published a proposed revision, um, a revised version of the uniform guidance back in January of 2020. And they published the um, the final rule in the Federal Register in August. Um, and then they published a second rule in the Federal Register in February with some correcting amendments. In addition to OMB, there are other influences, such as the president's management agenda, executive orders, and presidential memos. And there are also some developments in technology and the use of data. Always, they, these are also changing the way we manage federal funding. So let's look at some past regulations what, and other actions. What happened in the past that has brought us up to where we are today? So first of all, there are a bunch of federal regulations that apply to administering grants. First of all, you have the program statute. The program statute is a public law that's passed in Congress, and it's codified into law under a big compendium of laws called the U.S. Code or the USC. So every single federally connected grant originated from some public law, from some program statute that was passed by Congress. Another word for that is an authorization. There has been some legislative authorization for each of these federally connected grant programs. And then in addition to the act that created the grant, every federal agency has its own federal agency regulation. And that federal agency regulation is also codified into law, but it's in a different compendium of laws. It's codified in the CFR or the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, the uniform guidance, which is what this webinar is based on, it is also codified in the Code of Federal Regulations. It's under Title II of the CFR Part 200. So you look at the uniform guidance in the Federal Agency Reg and you think, well, these guys are both in the CFR. So what's the difference between the CFR and the U.S. Code? Well, the U.S. Code is considered constitutional law or congressional law, and it's written in very broad language, like we want to reduce health disparities in the United States, or we want to reduce deaths on the highway by requiring seatbelt use. But there's not a lot of information about how to go about doing it. So along comes the Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR, which is considered federal administrative law. And federal administrative law will provide more details, more step-by-step -step instructions about how to get things done. 
how to implement what's in the U.S. Code. So that's the difference between the U.S. Code and the CFR. And so then you say, well, what's the difference then between the uniform guidance and the federal agency reg? They're both in the CFR. Well, the federal agency reg is written specifically for that that a particular federal agency, that federal agency. So the federal agency reg will reflect what's in the uniform guidance, but it will also include specific regulations that are important only to that federal agency. For example, the Environmental Protection Agency, you know, is interested in the environment and reducing pollution. So you will have a lot of uh, regulations in the EPA federal agency reg about pollution. You're not going to see one word of pollution in the uniform guidance. Health and Human Services has a lot of requirements about health. You're not going to see one word of health in the uniform guidance and, and so on and so forth with each federal regulation. So it's good to know and to have access to both documents. The federal agency reg will reflect what's in the uniform guidance, but will always have something specific to that federal agency where the uniform guidance is written in the broadest, most general language because the uniform guidance applies to everybody. It applies to all federal agencies. It applies to all non-federal entities. And that's why you won't see any program references in the uniform guidance, just strictly administrative requirements. <clears throat> and then in addition to those big three federal regulations, you have the award document or the award agreement, which would reflect what is in the, uh, what federal regulations would apply. And then you have something called executive orders, which are also laws and then presidential memos. So these are the different influences at the federal level that comes um, into play. So what happens if all of these different regulations say something a little different? I mean, it would be really wonderful if they all said the same thing, but they don't always say the same thing. So when there's a difference in what these regulations say, which one do you follow? Which one takes precedence? So the U.S. Code always takes precedence because that is at the top of the mountain, that's congressional constitutional law. And then comes the CFR usually. So, okay, the uniform guidance and the federal agency reg are both in the CFR. So which one goes first? Generally, it would be the federal agency reg because the federal agency reg will have that additional programmatic information in it that the uniform guidance does not have. So when there is a difference in the regulations that we are following, the best practice to follow is to follow the most restrictive regulation. The award agreement should reflect everything that needs to be followed. And now we're going to uh, forward the slide and we'll talk about the next types of regulations. So here are some important public laws and other actions that have been happening really basically for the you know the past 20 years I, I went back to 1977 because that was a significant federal grant the federal grant and cooperative agreement act provided the definitions what is a grant what is a cooperative agreement and what is a contract so that was a fairly significant piece of legislation that provided those definitions in 1999 you have the federal financial assistance Management Improvement Act, that was the big act that created Grants.gov. We think that, you know, for all of us who are using Grants.gov, we, we just think it's always been around, but it's only been about 20 years. And that act, of course, totally revolutionized the pre-award process because it's it took us out of paper and brought us into the digital age on the pre-award side. And then um, in 2006, 
excuse me, in 2006, we have the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act, and that act created another great big digital asset, usaspending.gov, where all the grant reporting is posted. So now we have a big digital web asset on the pre-award side and on the post-award side. And this started the movement into the transition from paper and paper reporting and paper um, actions to to digital electronic submissions and electronic reporting. In 2009, you have an executive order uh, saying, hey, you know, we're looking, there are a lot of mistakes with these grants and people are making mistakes with them, spending of money and uh, we've got to do something about reducing improper payments. And in addition to that, we have the National Defense Authorization Act, which is typically in the contract community, not the grants community. But in that year, they decided they created the FAPIS database and the federal agencies that gave out contract awards were supposed to do pre-award risk assessments of um, before they um, decided to uh, award um, a program to a contractor or not. And then you have the Recovery Act that also happened in 2009. In 2010, we have a formal act, a piece of legislation from Congress that says, hey, we've got a problem with improper payments. Um, we need to, federal agencies, you've got to do a better job. And if your recipients are not performing and are not spending the funds properly, you need to take the money back. So now they're not only doing audits, but they're doing recovery audits. Oops, went too far. In 2011, that's an M number, we had a presidential memo uh, that created the Council of Financial Assistance Reform, which worked with OMB to create the uniform guidance. And in 2012, things started to get a little bit more um, pressure with reducing improper payments, and they strengthened the language of that law. In 2013, we now have the first version of the uniform guidance. It was effective for federal agencies only. A year later, in 2014, it became effective for everybody. And now in 2020, we've had this major revision where they've updated the language. And we expect about every five years to see a revision. Also in 2014, we had the Data Act, the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act, which created um, 57 standard data elements to use with grant reporting and grants administration. And they also um, pulled usaspending.gov out of GSA. They were the original agency that managed that site. And they moved um, usaspending.gov to the Treasury Department so that they could connect it to the federal financial systems. In 2015, the NDAA took FAPIS that was just for the contract community and they extended it to the grant community as well. So all you federal agencies that give out grant and cooperative agreement awards, everybody has to do better risk assessments, especially the pre-award risk assessments. In 2016, we have the GONE Act, which focused on um, issues with the closeout process for closing out grants. And one of the, the big revisions in the new version of the uniform guidance has to do with closeout. And we'll go over that, that new provision in detail because it has very aggressive language in it. Um, in 2017, there was a presidential memo that just had to, hey, we've got to do a better job with reforming the government and being more efficient and being more cost effective. In 2018, when President Trump was president, he had a formal president's management agenda. <clears throat> and one of his priorities, goal number eight, focused just on grants. Now, President Biden has not announced a formal president management agenda yet. <clears throat> We're waiting to hear, but he has been 
issuing a lot of executive orders. He's been bez very busy in that regard. He's issued, you know, release funding for grants, these big infrastructure grants. I know that Amy said that California is going after a big Department of Transportation grant and broadband and these infrastructure grants. There's a FEMA grant <clears throat> that they're working on. So we're waiting to to see but in the meantime the biden presidency has created a new website um, digital.gov and they are posting a lot of their priorities on that website and we'll talk about that in this presentation in 2019 you have the grant reporting efficiency and agreement act the great act that act is in pilot stage and this act will create some standard data elements for grant reporting. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're waiting to see what those standard data elements will be and if there's going to be a new reporting form for grants as a result. Also in 2019, not on the timeline, they passed the Federal Data Strategy Act, which is, you know, for federal agencies to, to focus on data saying, hey, we, we're collecting all this data now. How are we going to store it? How are we going to protect it? Who has access to it? Um, and so there was a Federal Data Strategy Act in 2019. And also in 2019, they updated that improper um, Payment and Elimination Act again. Now it's called PIA, P-I-I-A, for Payment Integrity um, and Information Act. So uh, still there's a lot of attention on um, bad payments and improper payments, which could be anything from mistakes all the way through waste, fraud, and abuse. And then, of course, that brings us up to 2020 with the revised uniform guidance, which is the center of what we're, we're going to focus on. Now, here for your convenience, I listed a slide that goes chronologically, and here are some major federal websites that were created as a result of these legislative actions. So grants.gov, USDAspending.gov, the Recovery Act had its own website, recovery.gov. There's FAPIS.gov, which is the Federal Awardee Performance Integrity Information System, where um, recipients and contractors who've gotten into trouble are, it's, it's a bad database. If, 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 if recipients of non-federal entities have had difficulty providing stewardship of funds, they end up in this FAPIS database, which is, is not a good place to be. And then the paymentaccuracy.gov was the website that was created from the Improper Payment um, Elimination Act. And it's a website that lists all the federal agencies and how much money they're taking back every single year. It's really quite remarkable if you've never seen it. And then, of course, we have SAM.gov, where all non-federal entities have to register in order to receive grants. And uh, and now the Data Act, they're still working with USAspending.gov and SAM.gov and um, up, updating SAM.gov and, and moving USAspending.gov to the Treasury Department to improve the uh, ability of the site to track funding. So a, an executive order, unlike a public law, doesn't go through Congress. It is strictly a, a law that comes from the White House. And historically, they were meant to be proclamations, like ceremonial in nature. Let's name a national park, for example. They were not intended to be um, ways to pass significant domestic policy. Um, but now with they have become um, exactly that. If, if a presidential administration, whether it's Republican or Democratic, it doesn't matter if they're not getting along with Congress and they don't think that Congress would support a law that the White House would like, the White House will just skip Congress and they will issue an executive order and though that creates a lot of drama. So executive orders have the full force of the law, but they bypass Congress. That's very significant because A, it means there's not, a, they're fighting over the law, number one, they don't agree with it. <clears throat> number two, the White House does not, 
does not control the 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 appropriation the budget of the United States Congress does so if the White House passes a law that bypasses Congress they're going to bypass the Congressional Budget Office there will be no appropriation behind that law so it becomes an unfunded mandate and that creates a lot of drama like okay how are we going to implement this executive order without any money and a famous one under a democratic administration the um <clears throat> biden the uh sorry the obama there you go there's a new name the obiden right <laughs> the obama administration was um an executive order to grant um citizenship to undocumented immigrants and a big executive order that created a lot of drama under the Trump administration was the wall with Mexico. So no funding for either of those. Now, the Obama administration was able to transition his executive order into DACA, into the DREAM Act. So there was some support finally with Congress, but still, um, a lot of grumbling one way or the other with that, but the the wall with Mexico was never never trans never transitioned to a public law. Now the link that I have for you is a, a landing page, so you can see a list of all the president the presidential executive orders and there are a lot they start with the most recent ones on top moving backwards so as i said president biden has been very active not all of these executive orders have to do with grants but a lot of them do and here are some examples of executive orders the emancipation proclamation was first an executive order, although President Lincoln was able to pass three public laws during the Civil War years that addressed the um, the, the priorities of the Emancipation Proclamation. So it they became you know and a public law is much more um, significant. It's long lasting. An executive order can be rescinded by another president. So Truman integrated the armed forces. So during wartime, these executive orders become a little bit more serious. And then during the recent 10 years or so with all the this fractious nature in Congress, White House administrations have been using executive orders more frequently as well. George Bush restricted public access to all the White House, all the presidential papers. I don't know why, but he did. And then when Obama was elected, he rescinded it. So the public had access to presidential papers again. So again, these executive orders can be rescinded. Um, here are some executive orders that happen to, to, to deal with grants. So we had one that dealt with suspension and debarment, which is now a law. And they're improving program performance. There's reducing improper payments, which are now laws. Uh, delivering an efficient government and having open machine readable formats for reporting. Presidential memos are not law. They're just like memos, like any kind of a business memo, but they're special in that they come from the White House. So the memo, the, the presidential memo is issued from the White House through OMB to federal agencies to take action on a particular mat matter. And like the executive orders, they can be rescinded by a subsequent presidential administration. As far as non-federal entities go, I find that they provide you with a lot of insight. If the federal agencies have to take certain actions and those actions have to do with grants administration, those actions are going to trickle down to what the recipients have to do. So I've provided you with a link to the um, presidential memoranda so you can see them and not attached to this presentation, but, uh, but I provided a very recent presidential memoranda, memorandum from President Biden, which was delivered to federal agencies in March after the um, 
um, American, um, uh, not the American Cares Act, but um, the let's see which one it is. American Rescue Plan. Oh, thanks, Amy. The big American Rescue Plan. I have a hard time remembering that one. And you have a copy of this memo on um, the OPR's website so you can, A, see what a presidential memo looks like, and then you can see the type of information that's included. This memo has two appendices um, attached to it, and one has to do with um, manage, managing payments, integrity, and risks related to American Rescue Plan funding. So, and they refer to the Payment Integrity Information Act. So again, they're raising the bar, they're putting the pressure on uh, monitoring audits, recovery audits, all of that. So more attention to spending authority, spending money better, and, and and more accurately. And then the second appendix has to do with achieving more equity-oriented results for financial assistance. So that second appendix specifically is targeted to grants and cooperative agreements. So I found that these presidential memos provide early warning signs of what's going to come down the pike to non-federal entities. And you have that um, included with your um, on, on the governor's website. And then if you wanted to get them directly from the federal website, there's the link. Some presidential memos are examples. President Clinton in the year 2000, when we were all worried that the, our computer systems were going to crash when the clock struck January 1st, the year 2000, he had a lot of memos out to federal agencies about you better do backups, you better have servers, <laughs> you know, just in case. Um, George Bush want, reminded um, federal agencies to post their uh, sub their grant announcements on grants.gov shortly after grants.gov was launched. President Obama wanted reporting of metrics of the uniform guidance and President Trump rescinded it. Very interesting. So some presidential memos are that have to do with grants. Oh, here's a slide with some examples. So suspension debarment, shared services. And as far as the uniform guidance goes, all of these public laws, the legislation, the executive orders, the presidential memos, they all um, point to the fact that the, the grant guidance, the uniform guidance needs to be updated and it needs to, its language is now more aggressive with expectations to reduce waste, fraud and abuse and with expectations to correct any deficiencies, focusing on performance and results. So the uniform guidance has been and will continue to be updated since its first release. And some major updates have to do with the DUNS number being replaced with a, a unique entity identifier. We'll go over that. Um, the FAPIS provisions were added from the contract community to the grant community and procurement has been revised. Let's talk briefly about funding levels. So there's a lot of money that the federal government gives out to non-federal entities every single year. There are about $500 billion for federal contracts, 700 to 750 billion for financial assistance, that's grants and, and cooperative agreements, and you put the two of them together and it's $1.2 trillion of federal funding that's put in the hands of non-federal entities to provide good stewardship of those funds and mistakes happen. Um, with COVID, there has been so much COVID funding in the year 2020 that that is going to significantly increase the grant funding totals. And we're waiting to see just what those reports are. Now of that $750 billion of 
federal grant money that's given out every year, the GAO, Government Accountability Office, does a report every year. And the 2020 report reported on the 2019 figures. So we're waiting for their 2021 report to come out with the COVID funding. But of the 750 50 billion dollars that was given out in grants in 2019 there were 175 billion improper payments so that's just a shocking number and no wonder congress is upset and omb is upset and all the federal agencies are upset and basically non-federal entities are upset too because it means there are harder and harder and more and more complex regulations that everyone has to follow because of this issue with the improper payments and here are just some examples of um, improper payments in 2014 with recoveries when the uniform guidance was first uh, became effective for non-federal entities, federal agencies recovered more than $32 billion of award funding. And it's been since 2016, about 20 billion a year that they've taken back. We expect that number to go up because of COVID funding. So no wonder there's all this attention to proper management. The need for greater stewardship of federal funds and the risk of waste, fraud, and abuse have resulted not only in updates to the uniform guidance, but also in these recoveries, recovery audits. So now let's talk about well, what has changed from the old version to the new version. So the final rule was posted in the federal agency uh, August 13th, and the um, rule became effective in November, November 12th, 2020. There were four parts, four different parts of the Code of Federal Regulation that were updated concurrently. So that was a combination notice. And it updated Title II of the CFR Part 25, which had to do with the DUNS number. It updated Title II of the Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR Part 170, which had to do with subrecipient reporting and posting on USAspending.gov. It created a new law to CFR 180 do not contract with the enemy, which sounds like a no duh, but um, there was a problem. The, the enemy has gotten very clever. And in 2015, a terrorist organization, and I don't know whether it was Al Qaeda or um, Hezbollah, but one of those terrorist organizations started an American company. And it was a fake company and it was, um, they got an EIN number and a DUNS number and they registered with SAM.gov and they applied for a federal contract and they got it, they were awarded. Can you imagine it passed the risk assessment? But during the monitoring, they were, they were purchasing all this video surveillance equipment for use with spying. You, <laughs> you know, instead of doing the project that they were supposed to do. So they were discovered and uh, the authorities went after them. But now we have this warning, do not contract with the enemy, please do better pre-award risk assessments because our enemies are, have gotten very clever. And then in 2002, Title II of the CFR Part 200 was the uniform guidance that was updated. So here I've given you two links so you have access to the Federal Register announcements. There was one from the original final rule from August 13th, 2020, and then the update in February 22nd of 2021. Now let's go through some of these updates. So those of you may know, and some of you may not know, that the DUNS number is going to be phased out. And that was announced back in July of 2019 with the Federal Register through, a, uh, through an announcement uh, from GSA. And the, the replacement is called a unique entity identifier number. The numbers, every non-federal entity will receive one when they um, renew their registrations in SAM.gov. So pay attention when you renew your registration this year and, and next year because they are going to um, 
assign these numbers through April of 2022. They think they'll be done by that point. Now, the difference is the old DUNS number was nine digits. And the new um, UEI number is actually going to be a 12 alphanumeric um, it's not really a number, a, you know, a character. So it's going to be alphanumeric and then 12 spaces, 12 characters. So everybody's IT systems are going to have to be updated with a new field to accommodate the new UEI number when you finally get it. So again, check your renewals when you register in SAM.gov because that's when you're supposed to receive autom a system generated UEI number. We won't, everyone will start using it concurrently in April, 2022. So if you get one assigned this year, just pay it, just make a note of it. Everyone will still be using the DUNS number until we get the go ahead to make the switch in April of next year. In addition to the DUNS number, um, all non-federal entities will receive more stronger, more secure login credentials through a federal website called login.gov. And this was mentioned in the final rule and there was a GSA update um, in October of last year. I'm trying, sorry guys, there we go. So here are um, links for you to read up on the entity ID post, their articles posted on the GSA website and on their blogs to let you know what the extension is. It was originally supposed to be finished by December, 2020, but COVID hit and with operational, it reduced operational capacity, there was an extension. So there are the key links for information about the DUNS number. That's a significant change. It will affect every form, every financial system, federal and non-federal entity. So the transition will go live um, in April of 2022, and registrants must also provide information as as part of the revision in the uniform guidance. They, when you renew in SAM.gov, you're going to need to provide information on the owners and the predecessors of your non-federal entity, any parent and subsidiary companies, in addition to organizational information that it typically asks for. So there's going to be some additional information that's required in SAM.gov. You as the recipient must contain current information in the SAM. This includes information on your immediate and highest level owners and subsidiaries, as well as on all your predecessors that have been awarded a federal contract or grant within the last three years. So that's more information that's going to be required in SAM.gov. And then every single grants.gov form is going to have to be updated because of this new UEI number. And you can keep track of the progress on grants.gov at that link. Two CFR 170 has to do with sub award reporting. There weren't a lot of changes. They they changed some. They updated some thresholds. Um, agencies have to report awards over the micro purchase threshold and awards that were um, over $30,000 have to include the award terms being reported now. So uh, reporting includes awards uh, to federal agencies. There are a few awards that go from federal agency to federal agency. There are not many of those, but their federal agencies now have to do this reporting if they receive a federal award. Foreign organizations, foreign public entities, and for-profits. For-profits are usually associated with receiving contract awards, but there are some for-profits who receive grant awards, uh, possibly a for-profit that's running a healthcare center in, in an underserved community, or just think of all the for-profit pharmaceutical companies that receive federal funding to come to discover a, a vaccine for COVID. So for-profits now have to pay attention to the grant reporting. 
and here's this new one, Never Contract with the Enemy, and it had to do with um, this 2015 federal contract. Uh, now it applies not only to federal contracts, but to grants over $50,000 performed outside the U.S. Probably won't affect this audience, but it's but it's good to have raised awareness that there's an additional level of scrutiny now. The uniform guidance had three provisions that were updated as a result of that new public law in the CFR. So there's a do not contract with the enemy provision now at 200-215, calling for better risk assessments for international awards. Um, there in 2200.216, in that provision is, is reference to forbidden video surveillance equipment. The federal government's position is, well, these manufacturers sell equipment to terrorist organizations. We do not want any of our federal funding going to any of these manufacturers. So that's what 216 is about. And 200.471 is in the cost principles, again, about this video surveillance equipment that was being purchased. We do not want to deal with manufacturers who, who sell merchandise to uh, terrorist organizations. And now here we are with the uniform guidance updates. So one of the changes is um, has to do with the definitions. There were 99 definitions before. The definitions were were labeled 200.1 through 99, and of course, it filled up all the two-digit characters. And if OMB wanted to add another definition, there was no space for it. So one of the changes was okay. All the definitions are still there. They're going to be in alphabetical order, but they're all going to be numbered 200.1. And that way we can remove definitions and we can add definitions. And there's not a, you know, there's no problem with us filling up the numbers. So it's, that was changed for ease of addition and removal. Um, the definition of non-federal entity was not revised in the uniform guidance as it was in the, um, with the DUNS number and with the reporting. So we don't have foreign public entity, foreign organizations, or for-profits in the definition of the not, for non-federal entity in the uniform guidance. And then also missing is federal agency. The definition has been changed in 2 CFR 25 and 170. I don't know why they didn't change it in in the uniform guidance. Uh, it might have been an oversight. So if you are, for state governments who are giving out sub-awards to sub-recipients, or if you're a sub-recipient, you would want to make sure that you understand your award document, and the award document would need to spell out whether you have to follow the uniform guidance or not, and they usually do. So federal agencies may apply the uniform guidance subparts A through E to these other um, types of non-federal entities, um, but it's not a must. So, and then it doesn't mention subpart F audit. So again, this doesn't match the new definitions in part 25 and, uh, and part 170. So what we do is we fall back on what the award agreement says. The final rule, so 200.110 is a provision in the uniform guidance about effective date, and the final rule became effective last November, November 12th, 2020, and then there were some correcting amendments that were effective February 22nd, 2021. Um, everyone always asks about, well, what about the indirect cost rate? Does the indirect cost rate change right away? And the way that the language was read, uh, reads, in, it said that if you had an existing indirect cost rate as of November 12, 2020, your existing indirect cost rates remain in effect until they expire based on the non-federal entity's fiscal year. So you can share that provision number with your auditors or your financial departments to make sure that you've got your um, your indirect cost rate covered. And the slide just got bigger. I don't know why, um, but um, 
let's see if I can, Amy, I can't, there we go. It's interesting how the, the slides changed a little bit, but at least you guys can still clearly see the, at least it's changed the view on my computer, but it looks like you guys can still see the slides clearly. I think it looks and fine. What, yeah, great. Thanks, Amy. So um, the effective date, again, your negotiated indirect cost rates remain in place until they're renegotiated and changes to indirect rates become effective at the non-federal entity's next fiscal year. And um, now 200-202 is a new provision in the final rule that has to do with grants and cooperative agreements. And there's a focus on achieving uh, program goals and objectives. So it supports the old president's management agenda. It supports President Biden's new initiatives that he has posted on on digital.gov, www.digital.gov. And it supports, um, again, it, the uniform guidance reiterates the importance of, of performance and results. Granting agencies are to hold recipients accountable for performance, and it reflects language that was in the Evidence Act that was also passed in 2019 and that it actually refers to logic models. And we had a, we did a, a, a webinar last year just about logic models and what they are and how you can use them with evaluations. And um, your governor's office has, has those, Amy has posted that, that webinar, it's still on your website. So you can see a, a recorded copy of it if you're interested in, in logic models. 200-203 just says that, oh, the old term of the catalog for federal domestic assistance has now changed its name to assistance listings. And the old website, CFDA, is now, um, within sam.gov which is still in beta beta form because they're they're still moving things over so it also notes that the listing in the um the description of the grant opportunity in assistance listings must align with the federal agency's strategic plan and part six of a federal of a circular that's not a grant circular that's a management circular that federal agencies follow here's the new 200 215 which do not contract with the enemy that we talked about and it applies to federal grants and cooperative agreements over fifty thousand dollars that are awarded outside the United States. You know, Department of State has a lot of international grants, National Science Foundation, U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, even U.S. Department of Education has teacher exchanges. So there are a lot of federal grants that are awarded to um, foreign governments and, and international organizations. There's the new 200-216, which is prohibition on certain equipment. That's, that's that video surveillance equipment. And that also affected 200.471, which is the um, definition in the cost principles. Performance measurement is at 200.301. I like to give you all these citations in case you want to look up the source language rather than just depending upon my summary. So um, federal awarding agencies and non-federal entities must measure performance. And the performance goals and indicators and milestones now must be included in award agreements. And this aligns with the Evidence Act. So more focus on performance. And they don't call them deliverables. They, they call them deliverables in the contract community. And in the grant community, they're referred to as um, outcomes. Did they make, did the non-federal entity achieve its anticipated outcomes, what it promised in the proposal. Um, internal control is, has not changed, but it's such an important provision that I included it here for you um, in this presentation because it has to do with monitoring and risk assessments and all non-federal entities are expected to have a good system of internal control, how they conduct their business. There are two models that are 
uh, mentioned, there's the Green Book, which is posted on the Government Accountability's Office Green um, website. And there's another model, the COSO model, which is posted on the COSO website. COSO is a financial services nonprofit. The models are basically the same. Um, they're just written a little differently. The Green Book is targeted more for federal agencies and the COSO model is targeted a little bit more for non-federal entities. But they both contain five components and 17 principles and the provision in the uniform guidance is 200-303. So here is just a chart to um, kind of map out for you what the five components of internal control are. And their control environment, that's your leadership who signs off on things, doing risk assessments, with, which we've already talked a lot about, um, control activities, that's like your policies and procedures and monitoring, um, information and communication is tra staff training and how you communicate to each other, how you're supposed to manage your grants and manage, you know, just the general conduct of business. And then there's a special one for monitoring. Now there are 17 principles and here are the 17 principles and each of these principles are listed under the five components of internal control. And I wanted to just give you this slide to be a handy resource for you. Um, you can incorporate the language of internal control into the proposals as you are applying for grants. Yes, we have written policies, procedures. Yes, we do conduct risk assessments. Yes, we do um, evaluate our, our, our performance. And you can incorporate this language into your proposals and into your progress reporting. So I wanted to include it for you as a resource. Period of performance is defined at 200.309, and there's more attention to the period of performance, and it affects no-cost extensions now, terminations, and renewal periods of awards. It also is mentioned in the closeout provision. 200.317 to 327 are your procurement provisions. There was a grace period that ended in 2018. In 2019 was the first year that all non-federal entities had to follow the procurement provisions in the uniform guidance, which was difficult for a lot of non-federal entities because they were more complex. Um, the old citations were 200, 317 to 326, and now they've added a new provision that bumps it up to 327. They've added a provision for Buy America, Buy American Act. You know, when you're purchasing and you're procuring equipment and supplies, try to get made in America. So there are some new and some revised requirements for um, procurement provisions. Uh, there, the thresholds have changed. The National Defense Authorization Act back in 2017 and 18 suggested raising the procurement thresholds. The micro purchase raised from was raised from $3,500 to $10,000, and the simplified acquisition threshold was raised from $150 to $250. But the uniform guidance was not yet updated. It is now updated with these new thresholds, which everyone seems to be very positive about. The FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulation, which is for federal contracts, that's also been updated with the micro purchase up to $10,000 and the simplified acquisition threshold up to $250,000. Now, what's the significance of all this? In the uniform guidance, they now call 200.320 an informal procurement method, which is easier than going through a formal bid process. So if if you're purchasing something at the micro purchase level, um, that's certainly an easier procurement. Non-federal entities are just able to go purchase without going, no price quotes, no bid process. And in addition to the $10,000 threshold for grants, now not the FAR, but for the uniform guidance, the micro-purchase can be 
raised up to $50,000 with documented justification. You would need to document that with your awarding agency, your federal awarding agency. And then you can even go over $50,000, but you'd need federal agency approval for that. So it's very interesting um, the, that, that flexibility there to help make the procurement a little bit easier because there was, there, there was such unhappiness throughout the grant community about the procurement provisions in the uniform guidance and how difficult it was to go through the bid process. Um, these increased values also have to be authorized under state, local, and tribal laws. So procurement is one of these things that's heavily governed by state law. So you would need to make sure that the state law has would allow for these additional incremental changes. The nice thing about um, purchasing below the simplified acquisition threshold, which is now considered $250,000, that it's considered a small purchase or an informal purchase. And there's no, again, even with a small purchase, there's no need for a formal bid process. The micro purchase does not require price quotes. The small purchase does. But how hard is that to get two or three price quotes? And you can purchase an awful lot of things that are a quarter million dollars or less. So it's not so hard now to use the procurement provisions in the uniform guidance. It's much, much simpler. And these provisions have been, um, these changes have been very well received in the grant community. And then here's just a, a, a slide about the new provision 200321, which is the Buy America, by, from the Buy American Act. Please purchase Made in America whenever possible. And, you know, it's very difficult because even our technology, our American made computers all have Chinese chips inside and Chinese circuitry, you know. So, it's it's tricky for this buy American. 20329 has to do with grant reporting and um and and the Great Act. So we're waiting to see if they're going what the new um standardized data mail elements are with the with grant reporting. So this is a change that's still in progress. Um, the first three years of the GREAT Act through 2022 are in a pilot stage. They're supposed to come up with standards in one year, and then they're supposed to implement them. You know, they have to test them out and see how they work with reporting. <coughs> Excuse me. And I don't know whether they're going to have a, a new standard report format. We have to wait and see. Machine readable formats is defined in 200.336 in the uniform guidance and it supports the Evidence Act. So OMB wants later machine, machine languages that are more, um, they're, they, well, they're open formats, that's what they're called. So when someone, when a non-federal entity submits a report, the, the report data can easily be read under the newer um, systems. So one thing that you may want to do on your to-do list after this um, webinar is to check with your technology departments, to check with you, to see, well, hey, you know, what do our IT systems, do we have open machine readable formats? Because that's not now a requirement. I know when I worked in the field, I was working for public institutions of education. Our, our systems and servers were as old as the hills. I would be very surprised if they were in these new machine readable formats. So that might require some, some modification that might cost some funding, you know, locally. So that would be a good question to ask. Here's closeout, which I wanted to go over with you with some detail. The old provision was 200-343. It's now been bumped up one because, you know, OMB has added some new provisions like the new Buy America Act 
has now pushed all the provision numbers over one. So um, some of the language has changed in the closeout provision, and some of and two of the provisions are new. It used to be 243 A through G. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Now it's 200-344-A through I. So there's a new H and there's a new I. And then A through G have been modified. So here's the details. Subrecipients are still to submit final reports to their pass-through entities within 90 days of the end of the period of performance. Pass-through entities and other recipients now have 120 days to submit their their final reports so that has been an, that has increased to help because everyone was always late with reports not everyone but reports were notorious late here's a big change federal agencies must complete closeout by one year after the end of the period of performance and you, well, wait a minute that sounds familiar they were supposed to complete closeout a year previously, yeah, but they the year started counting down at a different point. Closeout used to start when the awarding agency received the final report. The final report indicated that all actions were done, completed. And closeout would start when that final report was submitted. Well, if the final report was late, then closeout would start late. Congress has put an end to that. The end of the period of performance, the end date of the grant now starts the closeout period. They're totally ignoring whether the awarding agency receives the report or not. So awarding agencies have one year from the end date to complete closeout. So that is very much an abbreviated um, closeout period an abbreviated period to complete closeout. So there's more pressure. So the H, it gets a little worse. H is, well, what if a non-federal entity is late with their final reports? What if there's an open audit finding? What if there's an audit dispute? What if there's a problem with their indirect cost rate and they have a provisional rate, not a final rate? You know, what, what, what if there's a problem with cost sharing? I mean, there are a lot of issues that have caused these reports to be late and have caused close out to be late and now it doesn't matter h is very aggressive language if a non-federal entity does not submit all reports on time the federal agency must close the project using the information available within one year of the end date of the period of performance that's a huge change and how, what's what's the awarding agency going to do are they going to ignore the fact that there's a audit dispute and just go with the audit finding? Are they going to ignore the fact that the non-federal entity has a provisional rate, not a final rate? You know, or has, or, or things aren't, you know, what, what, how are they gonna handle that? This is going to open up a lot of, of discussion and debate and drama at closeout. So please, as non-federal entities, make sure you submit your reports. Make sure you close out, you're able to close out your project on time and you get those reports in because it gets worse. This is what I says. If the federal agency must close out the project using the information available, you know, the reports were never submitted. So if that happens, the federal agency must, that's a must, report the non-federal entity in FAPIS as a material failure to comply with the award terms and conditions. That is very punitive. So that designation will sit in FAPIS for five years and it will significantly and adversely affect that non-federal entity's ability to apply for more funding because they're gonna pop up in the pre-award risk assessments as being in FAPIS. So all non-federal entities, I'm encouraging you <laughs> to 
to have a discussion with your grant teams, you know, and to make sure you finish close out on time. You do not want to be entered into FAPIS with this designation, a material failure to comply with award terms and conditions. That is a big change uh, in the uniform guidance. De minimis is also changed. It's changed for the better. There's an expanded use of the de minimis. It used to be um, only non-federal entities that never, ever, ever, ever had a uh, negotiated rate before could use the de minimis. And now it's anybody, any non-federal entity that currently does not have a rate can use the de minimis. So if you had a rate and you couldn't keep up with it and it was too hard and you no longer have an indirect rate, you can now use the de minimis rate. No proposal, you know, again, as long as you have less than 35 million in federal uh, awards. And um, the other update besides the expanded de minimis rate is that all the negotiated rate agreements are going to be posted on a new public website, but they haven't, we don't have that website yet. So similar to the audit reports that are posted in the Federal Audit Clearinghouse, they're now going to have a website for um, negotiated rate agreements. And then, uh, you know, I'm going numerically, so we're in the 400 numbers now. So here in selected items of cost, here is again the mention of the new item 471, which has to do with the allowability of this telecommunications and video surveillance equipment and the forbidden, the list of forbidden equipment and forbidden manufacturers. So that was the August um, um, revisions. And now in February, here are some corrections. Even though they were supposed to change all the definitions to 200.1, they forgot to do so. So in February, they made sure that that provision number was changed to 200.1 for all the definitions. Um, there are some exceptions uh, that are mentioned in 200.102 um, that can be, there can be some leeway with some exceptions, but you'd have to get federal agency approval if you're asking for an exception. The pre-award risk assessments have now been updated, the language to reflect the Payment Integrity Information Act and the fact that they're there, there's more attention to performance and results. That's program performance and financial performance. And that the intergovernmental procurement agreements are encouraged to, um, to, to share services. So I know that when I was working in Maryland uh, for my school systems, we were allowed to purchase um, copier paper and toner from the state procurement contract. We had to still pay for it, but the state, because of the sheer volume, had a better rate for toner and copier paper. And the contract was already negotiated. There was no tax and there was no delivery. So it was a really good deal. And they call that intergovernmental procurement agreements. If you have it, that would be something to, to look into for California. Pass-through entities have more responsibility. So more responsibility on the state of California to resolve subaward audit findings, and that's uh, listed at 200332. Um, there are new changes to cost allocation plans at 20416 and Appendix 5, 6, and 7. Auditees must follow procurement standards when selecting an auditor. Um, and auditors must report significant or material deficiencies. There have just been updates. These provisions were always there, but there have been some subtle updates to the language. Um, hospitals, if, if, you, if you're a hospital or you work with hospitals, hospitals follow the uniform guidance, but they don't follow the cost principles in the uniform guidance. They uh, have to follow the cost principles in the HHS, the, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services reg, and that's codified at 2 CFR 75. And there was some anticipation that they were going to get rid of that requirement, but it's still there. <laughs> so for hospitals. 
If you're on the financial side of things, um, you've heard of the compliance supplement. For those of you who are on the program side of things, you may not have heard of it. The compliance supplement is a great big document that OMB publishes once a year, usually in the spring, and it's a list, it's guidance, it's a list of requirements that auditors follow um, when they do the single audits. I know that when I worked in the field, we always wanted a copy of it because we had to have a single audit and we wanted to know what the auditors were going to be looking for before the auditors came on site. So we would always get a copy of the compliance supplement. So here they here is the link if you want to see it it's it's very large it's usually 1600 pages very dry to read but they have a set of compliance tests and there are multiple parts in the compliance supplement part two is a matrix it's a chart that's helpful to read part three is where the 12 compliance tests are listed and that it could be helpful for monitoring so there's the link to the compliance supplement. In 2020, and I don't have any recollection in my memory of working in grants for 30 some years, but there was a second compliance supplement. The first one was the regular one, the normal one that we always got. It came out in August. The second one was issued in December. And there's the link to the second compliance supplement. And this one relates specifically to COVID funding, because there was so much COVID funding. They actually have two sets of compliance requirements for the auditors to follow this year. So here was the timeline. The latest revisions were initially announced last January and the rule was published in the Federal Register. They had um, public comments were due in March and OMB reviewed the co public comments and they published the final rule in August. The final rule became effective in November and then they had this correcting amendments in February and that was the basic timeline. So this is just a, a, a to raise your awareness because so many provisions have changed, it may be a consideration to look at your written policies and procedures. Federal agencies need to look at their federal agency reg and to update their regs to come into alignment with the revised procedures in the uniform guidance. And it would be a good, it would be a best practice for non-federal entities to also take a look at local policies and procedures, just to make sure um, that nothing needs to be updated. And I'm immediately thinking of the procurement procedures and the closeout procedures. It, it may be um, a consideration to check out your local policies to see if anything needs to be updated. And here, this brings us to our um, Q&A period. Amy, do you want to um, lead that part okay. of this? The Great. Great. So uh, if anyone has a question, you can go ahead and enter that in the questions tab. Pop this up, and um, we do have a question about having the slides available. And so, if anyone joined late and didn't hear that, uh, yes, we are recording this webinar, the recording, and the slides um, that you'll be able to download will um, be available on the OPR website. Again, if you go to opr.ca.gov, and then under CEQA and state clearinghouses, there's the link for federal assistance. And that is where um, the, everything is gonna be on the link um, on the federal assistance page for federal grant resources. Um, so on the federal grant resources page, the slides and recording will be available under the events and trainings tab. All right, so I don't um, see any other questions coming in. Uh, again, please go ahead and um, post that under the questions tab if you have anything you'd like to hear from Karen. And there was a lot of information. It takes time to digest. 
Let me go ahead, Amy, while they're thinking about whether or not they have questions, I'm going to go ahead and advance to the last couple of slides. Sounds good. So, um, whoops, this is just a reminder that the presentation was intended to provide general information and um, the OPR and uh, Kanoko are not providing legal or financial advice, please consult with your legal and financial advisors. However, we both sincerely hope that the information that was provided help, help give you some insights as you further pursue your work in the grants community. And then um, this was pre prepared for the Governor's Office of Planning and Research for the state of California. And um, there is my name um, and my contact information. And so if you think of a question after the fact, you can contact Amy at OPR or you can contact me directly. And then of course I will <coughs> update Amy if you have a question that's, you have my contact information and you can ask a question after the fact if, if need be. And with that, that brings us to the, you know, the end of the webinar. Amy, are there any closing comments you'd like to share? Um, just would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, again, that was really a lot of great information um, and so glad to have Karen to present today. And um, looking towards the future, we do have a series of other events going on as well. Uh, we are going to be having another webinar in May about uh, specifically about the new uh, procurement provisions. So we'll get into a little bit more depth about that. And uh, if anyone wants to reach out to me directly, um, you can email, uh, my name is amy.miller at opr.ca.gov. Uh, so you can email me directly for any of these links that we've mentioned before. Um, and again, please encourage, uh, encourage everyone to sign up for our federal grants e-list. And that's where you'll have more information about the future webinars. Um, you can also find out more about the future webinars at the OPR website, opr.ca.gov. You scroll down to announcements, um, click on the announcements tab, and you'll see that there is a page there for the future schedule of events as well. And I think with that, um, just want to thank everyone and um, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for attending today. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.